Hello and welcome to this session where we will be discussing the limits of the freedom of speech in the United States. Uh, I am joined by my wonderful panel here that you can see. Now, freedom of speech is a pillar of American democracy. and mobs to attack the structures of government? Should big tech curb the rights of individuals to free speech or should government keep the absolute freedom of expression granted to every citizen? Hello and welcome. Today we are joined by S.Y. Qureshi from Delhi, India, the former chief election commissioner over there. He is also uh, a published author. Lou Marinoff is professor of philosophy at the City College of New York the international best-selling author and veteran of more than 40 harassment meetings. Greg Lukanoff is the cap in Capitol Hill, uh, Washington, D.C. He's the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and best-selling author as well. Nuno Venturina is from Portugal. Thank you for joining us, Nuno. Professor of Philosophy at the Nova University and David Holt, mayor of Oklahoma City. So the structure of this uh, conversation we're about to have first, my wonderful speakers will get three minutes to express themselves and set the stool for their perspectives. Then they will be able to interact with each other's uh, comments and questions about what each other have said. Finally, we will go to questions from the audience and then some questions from me uh, and a few personal anecdotes from my speakers. So with that, let us begin. S.Y. Qureshi, first to you. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Nilofar, and uh, welcome, my colleague. Uh, U.S. and India are the two of the greatest democracies on Earth. Uh, one is the oldest, U.S., and India is the largest. And uh, we have similar debate in uh, both the countries uh, where, because free speech is considered very sacrosanct. Uh, at the same time, there is a lot of debate which goes on all the time. Our judiciary is very protective of it um, in U.S. and in India. Uh, at the same time, there is a need for reasonable restrictions um, uh, in, in pub larger public interest. Now, uh, freedom of an individual is sacrosanct, no doubt, but the larger public good also is um, a, a principle of law and uh, your uh, freedom to speak uh, should not uh, clash with my freedom for my security, my safety and public law and order. And that is a debate which goes on in USA as in India, and we need to the, find a solution. Now, is the freedom of a uh, speech um, to uh, does it allow uh, uh, provocation of uh, public disorder? Um, if, the, if it leads to bloodshed, for instance, uh, Charlie Hebdo, the incident, uh, as you know, caused bloodshed around, around the world because of some individuals right to the, uh, make fun of a prof profit of two billion people across the globe. Uh, surely uh, the, the public security safety of the central population should take precedence. Uh, similarly, can we have Kevin, can we even consider the, the same freedom to cast a question on uh, Holocaust? Will it not be treated as mischief? I'm sure it should be. So therefore, uh, the, uh, this brings the case for a reasonable restriction on this individual freedom. Now, I have noted that there are double standards uh, in USA um, uh, followed because same media, which is uh, uh, furiously protective of freedom of speech within the country, uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with the rest of the world, uh, they have uh, different standards. Uh, I wish uh, they... Uh, treated the world just as they treat the freedom of expression within the country. Now, we've also seen that the government uh, find the, this uh, freedom of expression sometimes as uh, adversarial. Uh, it happens in the U.S. and uh, even in India. Sometimes even it is considered uh, sedition. Now, the, the, we have to do a balancing act between uh, protecting the absolute freedom of an individual and the temptation to limit the freedom which the government uh, normally has. It is very important to resolve the dilemma through a clear legislation. Um, anything that leads to violence and public disorder has to be disallowed. After all, one citizen's right to free speech cannot supersede 
many citizens right to live in peace so for, i think for the moment i'll confine to just these two arguments and wait for my other participants as why krishi thank you so much for those opening remarks this idea uh, as you mentioned uh, the provocation of public disorder uh, and the seeming double standard that exists between united states domestic policy and united states foreign policy all i am sure we will go into momentarily i'd like to now hand over with 3 minutes to lou marinoff thank you very much as why if you can mute your mic please that would help perhaps uh the sound thank you so much and i hope i'll have a chance to take issue with you over something you just said uh which is uh, that uh, we cannot preempt speech uh because it might lead to violence the violence has to be stopped uh we cannot preempt free speech that is within tolerable limits so perhaps we have some ground for agreement there uh for example uh, i do agree with you that we need one uniform standard and not a double standard and that is very important in the us i'm sure as in india and i'll speak to the elephant in the room if trump was impeachable for january 6th and that's a debate that's not a a conclusion if he was then kamala harris nancy pelosi maxine waters chuck schumer and numerous other public servants are even more impeachable for their incitements to violence and that is a double standard in the US. It, I do not believe that incitements to violence should be permitted and I do believe at the same time that political speech has to be more robust. We can metaphorically speak of fighting for the cause one believes in without that being interpreted as an incitement to violence. But we need one standard. I would want to say that words have lost their meanings in our country because of relentless deconstruction. So for example, violent riots and insurrections led by Antifa and BLM in Democrat-run cities such as Portland were called peaceful protests even even though there were fires burning and 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 cars burning behind the CNN reporter who called them peaceful whereas the, the January 6th riot was actually called an insurrection and its comparison to 9/11 and Pearl Harbor by the radical democrats who made such comparisons is delusional deranged morally depraved and a grotesque insult to both history and humanity nonetheless freedom of speech would allow such comparisons but there has to be a countervailing view aired in order for fairness to prevail and that is not happening in the united states the playbook of the left is to shut down dissenting opinion so what i want to say really um is that one of the main problems we face and have faced for 30 years and i've been in the trenches for 30 years of the universities is the deliberate confusion of offense with harm in a civilized society you have a right not to be harmed and there's a remedy for harms offense is not the same if you say something that i don't like then i should change the channel or stop listening to you i don't have the right to shut you down that is the main thing that i want to say we cannot undermine the first amendment by people merely not caring for the opinions of another we have to entertain all opinions in order to have a fair and just society and i will stop there thank you lou marinov uh clear points there being made uh, about this idea of the left and the right treating the freedom of speech differently and being held to account on different levels at this point i'd just like to make a few comments uh, to before we we head over to to greg The freedom of speech for those of you who might not know uh, only curtails the actions of the government it does not uh, you have the right to the freedom of speech um as it might be enforced and it might be impinged upon by the government corporations large entities are not covered by the first amendment which was the brainchild of James Madison there are five freedoms afforded to you the freedom of religion press speech assembly and petition and i'm hoping that we can get into a few of those momentarily uh i'd like now to get uh, over to greg lukianov uh greg you are the founding um you were the president of the foundation for individual rights in education and a best selling author i'd like to give you 3 minutes to express your opinions on the freedom of speech please Oh uh, sure really quickly. Um I I I've written three books about free speech. Um one called Freedom from Speech which uh, I think captures where I think uh, we've headed. Um 
I have seen a d- deterioration in attitudes about freedom of speech over the last, uh, I'd say, six or seven years that far exceed anything I would have feared in 2001 when I started my career. Um, I've seen things just in the past five years that when I worked at the ACLU of Northern California in 1999 would just be uh, would just be unbelievable. And I have to remind students, and it's amazing that you have to remind students this, that free speech is about minority rights, um, that, that in a democracy, 51 percent has the power. So the rich and powerful have the power. You only need special protection for free speech for minority opinions. It's why the gay rights movement, the women's rights movement, the um, and the civil rights movement only started when our First Amendment started being interpreted strongly. But what I think that we're going through a little bit of a crisis of power not being able to check its own privilege, um, <laughs> that power has gotten so used to being in power that it has convinced itself that speech itself is the enemy. This is an idea that comes from incredibly rich, incredibly powerful institutions in the United States, uh, particularly protected, but we do not ban speech based only on offensiveness. Uh, things like blasphemy, sedition bans are what power always wants. They're always able to justify them. But having very clear standards against opinion should always be protected, and offensiveness alone cannot be uh, one of the standards on which you can be punished, are cornerstones of what makes free speech work, and but also what makes the U.S. different than other, other countries. We absolutely need to crack down on violence. We strongly need to protect speech, and the line is not that hard to draw. Conspiracy to commit crimes is not protected, but opinions are are, are, are uh, easier to, to uh, hunt down. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. And you are indeed uh, uh, right on time. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, we want, I want to move on a little bit, about, but I want to make one thing clear as we go on and have this discussion. Remember that your comments and your questions or any things that you uh, want to get across, please write them in the comment section and I'll get to them as soon as possible. But this idea of uh, the freedom to offend versus the the possibility of violence is something that we need to consider. Remember, opinions and speech that are intended to and likely to cause imminent violence or infringe on others' rights is not protected under that First Amendment. That That is something that we are clearly hearing. Mm-hmm. So with that, let's move on to Nuno you know, uh, from Portugal, Professor of Philosophy, Nova University. Please, you have three minutes. Thank you, Nelofar. So. Let me bring the very notion of limit into this discussion. Uh, Freedom of expression tends to be conceived in the United States and other democratic countries as uh, unlimited. So the laying down of any limits upon the freedom of expression is seen to be unacceptable. And a limitation imposed by the state would mean coercion. But the absence of limits to freedom of expression judgments and values that can cause harm to others. If the right to free expression is exercised to advocate that, say, ethnic minority members must be treated unequally, terrorism is legitimate, or women shouldn't vote, we are very far away from the noble principles of having freedom of assemblage, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, or freedom of the press. So, Does the First Amendment respond in an effective way to the problem at stake? Well, the First Amendment is vague enough, and the only restriction is, I quote, the right of the people peaceably to assemble. However, there are jurisprudential exceptions to its protections. Examples include uh, obscene speech, speech that induces criminal conduct, or speech that motivates lawless action. So, what about Europe? A few weeks ago, the Catalan rapper Pablo Hazel was arrested in Spain after he had been convicted by a court to nine months in prison for glorification of terrorism and slandering the monarchy. Another Catalan rapper, Valtonic, faced similar charges some time ago. Should artistic freedom be treated specially? There is a huge debate going on here in Europe about freedom of expression. And it's a very hard question 
to answer. You must bear in mind that Spain has a painful history of terrorism perpetrated by the Basque organization ETA. So maybe there are really some lines we shouldn't cross and constitutions must be specific enough in their protections. Thank you. Thank you so much for setting uh, your case at Nuno Venturina. We're moving on to David Holt, Mayor of Oklahoma City. David, you have three minutes, please. Well, thank you, and thanks for bringing us together today. Uh, this topic of the limits of freedom of expression brought a few things to mind for me that I'll touch on here quite briefly. And obviously, I look at these issues through the prism of being an American and being an elected official in America. And some of this has been covered, but we have several professors on the, on the Zoom here that, that obviously know that repetition is how people learn. So I don't mind repeating some of this. Our First Amendment protections for freedom of speech are internationally known, and they are integral to our American way of life but they are also widely misunderstood, even in America. Two points I wanna make on that. First, a sitting United States Congressman from North Carolina tweeted a misunderstanding last week that is all too common. And you touched on this a moment ago. He complained that private companies were limiting free speech and he stated at his, as his conclusion, and I quote, the first amendment isn't a suggestion. I can't believe we still have to make this statement in the United States, but it is clearly established in two centuries of jurisprudence that the First Amendment does not apply to private actors. It only prohibits the government from restricting speech. Secondly, certain speech is never protected from government regulation or private regulation, and that includes speech that is intended to incite violence or other illegal activity. The freedom of speech in America is not without some legal parameters. So to apply my two points in real life scenarios, comments by, made by Americans that in context are an incitement to violent insurrection, for example, are not protected speech and private companies can restrict as they see fit. Looking beyond legal restrictions, the other thing I wanna say real quick is that just because you can say something doesn't mean you should. America's relative success in sustaining a democratic republic for two centuries has been tied as much to our political culture as it has been tied to any document or legality. Since 1776, we have largely elevated the ideal in this country that truth must be dominant. We have a tendency to embrace exaggeration and hyperbole in our American political discourse, but we have traditionally had an understanding that some core truth must lie at the center of our arguments. Recently, many in American politics have simply abandoned truth, but it is incumbent upon anyone in American public life, and I certainly feel this obligation as mayor of America's 25th largest city, to stand for truth and really emphasize, especially right now, the need to have objective truth at the core of our arguments, even if it's not a truth we like. A lie may bring us comfort in the short term, but in the long run, none of us want to live in a post-truth society. None of us are winners when we interpret our freedom of expression to include the freedom to lie. Thank you, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. And that's David Holt, the mayor of Oklahoma City. Okay, so you have all heard very poignant and very uh, clear set cases for what the freedom of speech should be, what it is, how it's interpreted, and how that is translated across the world with our guests from Portugal in Europe and in Delhi in India. So now it's the part uh, of this discussion where I would like my panelists to engage with each other. I'll start things off. Uh, you know, you seem to nod fervently when Lou was sort of talking about this idea of free speech being curtailed by the left and the right. Can I ask maybe for you to comment um, on each other uh, a little bit? Yeah, Lou, do you want to start? <laughs> well, all right, if you're inviting a comment, I, I actually like what David just, I like what you all said mostly. David, that was great, uh, but we're going to have the perennial question from Pontius Pilate, what is truth? So uh, the truth, among other things, has to be discovered in an arena of contending and adversarial opinion, without which we don't have a hope of getting it. That's why our legal system works when it works, because we have a prosecution and we have a defense, and each presents their case to presumably uh, a fair jury of one's peers. That's how we can get closer to truth, but not by hearing only one side night after night. So, you know, I support that very much. I would like to go back to to SY. SY, you've touched on something really important with Charlie Ebdo. And I would like to say 
that we in America, as I believe in most of the free world, have placed a very high premium on freedom of expression in the media, such as political satire and social satire and other forms of humor, which are also at the same time thought provoking. The flip side of a joke is offense. A joke is not objective. Some people may find a joke funny. Other people may take offense at it. But under so no circumstances, under what I understand to be the First Amendment, would I be allowed to kill you for making a joke I don't like? And so where we draw the line in political satire has to be not that we're afraid to make jokes because two other people won't like them or with respect, sir, because. taking offense to the Charlie Hebdo uh, cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, um, they have a right to be offended. I mean, why should we or the global uh, community or journalists like myself police what we say because we, it might cause offense? Does that then mean that we shouldn't tell the news um, in a fact-based way? Should we censor ourselves because it might irk or, or cause uprisings in other parts of the world? Yeah. You know, although that I noticed by and large every speaker is uh, on the same page because they all talked of a need for a restriction. For instance, um, uh, somebody talked of blasphemy, um, uh, defamation, and then the speaker talked about obscenity and glorification of terrorism. Then uh, uh, David talked of incitement of violence and freedom to lie. So by and large, we are saying the same thing. And uh, coming to uh, Charlie Hebdo, the incident, uh, the, the freedom to offend, of course, the freedom of uh, expression includes freedom to offend. But at the same time, if it leads to large scale violence, um, uh, is it uh, uh, worthwhile uh, uh, kind of humor? Uh, we put the, the whole world into a kind of a very risky situation. So the... And it also uh, indirect, like, you know, there can be violence uh, to, when I use the gun, but I can be violent by using uh, the language with, that I use. So, you know, uh, perhaps we have to see whether oh, what is the consequence of that free speech. The consequences of free speech. Greg, you were shaking your head then um, at that idea. And I, and I want to. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not agreeing. No. Um, um, the, 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 uh, so, so, so there's, a, there's a couple things to go here. And one thing that I, I hear David's frustration, I'm, I'm politically left of center. Um, I, I work on campuses, though. And we are currently, it, it took me um, reading the work of Martin Gurry to really figure out what's going on internationally. Um, and essentially we're, we're in a sort of what he calls the fifth wave that essentially social media has hit us so hard and has brought so many eyes to every single issue. It's hard for any institution, idea or even individual that's cancel culture to stand up to the attention of, of, of millions of people. So we are in what I would what, what has been called an epistemic crisis at the moment. So there's a pull to sort of like say we have to get people to understand objective truth. But. Finding, figuring out objective truth is actually extraordinarily hard. Um, it, it, the discovery of ignorance is one of, it was really what the enlightenment was, was discovering, holy, we don't really know all that much stuff. And right now I have to say, I work on campus. You have a lot of reason not to trust some of the stuff that comes out of campuses right now. The New York Times has been terrifying me in some of, some of the things that's having it happening internally, even for people just, you know, covering things that don't toe, toe the line. There, there are, re there's a genuine epistemic crisis that's not entirely just in the heads of conspiracy theorists. So, so, and I think that at the other side of this negation, as Gurry calls it, there might be something very positive, but we're not there yet. And when it comes to like ideas of countries that want to ban uh, blasphemy, I, I think, you know, they have the right to do that. But but that's saying that they're not ready for free speech. That's saying that they don't want religious dissenters in their country. Um, but is and, America ready for free speech? As and it stands, okay. you had the events uh, of the 6th of January that proved that freedom of speech or the freedom to present fake news as real news or the, the freedom to disseminate, distribute and uh, profit from uh, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of hate speech or, or freedom of speech has consequences that other countries might look to the United States and be like, no, thank you. We do not want that. I mean, what do you make of that? And, and I quite, I want to pick up on what you said about this idea of being unapologetically pro-US pro version mm -hmm. of, yeah. of free speech in, in accordance with that. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's the thing is everything that happened on January 6th. And I, and I probably disagree with Lou on, uh, on this. I think it crossed the, the line into uh, constitutional incitement, what the president did. Um, I think, and, uh, you know, not all first amendment people agree on this, but con- particularly considering his powerful position, I think, it, I think it was. Um, and the, you know, marching on the Capitol, not protected. The, 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 the thing that I, that I feel like we're losing is one of the great inventions of human history is making a very, very stark distinction. Between via, uh, between action and work and opinion, um, and this is an invention. I know people on uh, you have kids on campuses thinking that they're so clever. They're just really that's a social construct. It's like yes, but one of the most successful social constructs for peace that has ever been created. You are entitled to your opinion. You are not entitled to conspire to commit crimes. All these kinds of stuff. And these these distinctions. Uh, when I go to these conferences and people talk like this is impossible to do, we do this in the United States all the time. You, you can tell when someone's taking steps towards actually committing a crime. Uh, and it's not the same thing as merely expressing an opinion. I think I think there's a lot to be said about the culture of receiving um, freedom of speech. I myself am from Afghanistan, and if you insult someone the wrong way, you will lose your head. Yes. Um, so I, I think the, the res- what I'm hearing from you is receiving free speech is as important as saying it out loud and i think this is at the heart of what sy is saying you know i want to come to you um you spoke about the this idea um of 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 rappers of artists being um uh you know taken in having having to face legal consequences um because of their art should artists be allowed to offend and incite violence or stand up for terrorists and others not I mean, what do we say? Do politicians have a certain place that they or role that they play? And artists have, what are you getting at there? Please expand. Yeah, I brought this this subject to, to our discussion because this has been a hot topic here. And um, so, so the debate uh, is, is about whether artists can, in, in this case, musicians can in fact uh, have total freedom of expression and express themselves as they wish, um, even if they, for example, uh, motivate people to, to terrorist um, uh, activities or, or whatever, or if uh, we are indeed crossing some lines when we, when we approach these issues. So uh, my opinion is that, in fact, there, there should be limits for this kind of, uh, for, for this kind of expression because, it, I mean, we, we know that rap is, in fact, a... Uh, uh, a musical genre with a, with a very strong social uh, dynamism, and um, and in this case, I think that um, of course, I mean, to, to arrest a musician during uh, several months, I think it's uh, it's too much. But um, there should be some kind of penalty, you know, to to avoid uh, uh, this kind of uh, this kind of activities. Set by whom should we be? Um giving that right and that privilege to our elected leaders? Should we be giving that light to the, to the legislature set by whom? That's a question I want to sort of keep at bay. David Holt, you spoke about the comfort of lies. Uh, this idea that uh, in order to regress, in order to, to go backwards on the progress that America has made and, and build so much of its outward facing um, sort of portfolio, is this idea that the truth is perceived at all costs and at any costs. But that the opposite of that is this comfort of lies. What do you mean by that? Um, and, and do you think that America currently in 2021 is living in a comfortable lie? Well, I sympathize with what others have said about, you know, the, how hard it is to find objective truth. And that can be true as you get in the murkier depths of, of policy issues. But what I'm really talking about are these enormous lies that have been promulgated in American politics over the last year that nobody really disputes, you know? I mean, nobody really thinks that the government is run by lizard people who are satanic uh, pedophiles, you know? I mean, well, I say that, nobody believes that. Uh, Thousands of people, millions of people apparently believe that. That's what I mean. Those are the kind of ridiculous, preposterous lies that have been promulgated on a grand scale. And then obviously the one that, that was sort of the precipitating factor for January 6th, this idea that the election was not won by the person um, that was officially, uh, you know, named the winner. And so, I mean, to your point, I mean, I just think elected officials, uh, to your question, elected officials are often put in a position where it would be to our short term benefit to tell a comforting lie to our constituents. And many, obviously, uh, many Republican elected officials in the United States over the last six months 
found themselves in that position. You know, they had a whole lot of voters that were upset with how the election had turned out. And, you know, that's understandable. We've lived through that, you know, 45, 46 times or whatever, you know, in the course of American history. And um, it certainly it's a hard place for an elected official to be sometimes to be standing in front of a crowd, either literally or metaphorically, and have to break the news to them that the election hasn't gone their way. And, and in this case, it seemed as if hundreds, if not thousands of elected officials chose to either tell or at least support or wink at this comforting lie. And, and unfortunately, as I said earlier, I mean, comforting lies only sort of work for a short amount of time. You know, in the end, none of us want to live in a society full of comforting lies. We have to tell objective truths especially uh, when they are painful and we just have to live with the consequences. But we can't get progress without truth. We can't get progress without truth. And uh, this, this question of America's big comfortable lie, uh, wrapping up this part of this discussion. Very lively, very interesting. Thank you so much to all of you. At this point, uh, we've got sort of 15 minutes left. Uh, I'm going to go to some questions that we've had in the comments section. And then finally, I'd like to do a round robin and get my panelists personal experience of freedom of speech and what it really means to them. Bait. Yeah, um, that's a great question, and and it's unfortunate but true um, that the lack of viewpoint diversity on American college campuses messes up. I think it actually has global consequences, and I could explain exactly why I mean that um, if you had some time. Um, but I do think that there is a reason why free speech was, um, you know, brought to campus in the in the early '60s, and and it wasn't even explained to me that the argument wasn't conservatives on campus. Campuses actually weren't conservative in the 1960s. It was still like a, a two to one ratio or three to one ratio liberals to conservatives on campus. But the idea was to bring more politics in, and the, and and that was something that was kind of disappointing to discover, you know, later on. And so th the um, and once that was allowed, there was a big shift. And I didn't realize I didn't realize until my book with Jonathan Haidt that the the number went from, you know, being more like a stable three to one or five to one political ratio to 30 to one or zero, you know, at, at a lot of these places. And this all accelerated in the late 90s. And the problem is when you're in power, you always see free speech as a threat. People in power always see, see free speech as a problem. And that's why by the time this became really established, there was this kind of move to go like, well, you know, uh, we want to go into repression of tolerance. We want to go into Marcusean territory where basically like we're, we're not we're not just going to uh, tolerate speech. We're going to clamp down on the stuff we don't like. And meanwhile, just to say really quickly, and, I, and this, uh, I think the most important value of free speech is this kind of truth that David's talking about. But I have a different conception of truth. And it's very simple. Knowing what people really think is always essential to knowing the world as it is, period. That's actually quite profound. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Greg. Not that you're not always profound, but this is <laughs> very profound. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to, no, goofy profound is where we're gonna we're gonna land. Um, Sumi Al Kipsi says, "Can private companies be effective advocates or defenders of free speech? For example, during the farmer protests in India, Twitter's inter uh, interpretation of the law differ differed from that of the government's." S Y. This seems to be a question from you. This idea that can private companies be effective advocates or defenders of free speech when it comes to the farmers' uh, protests in India? Uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, private companies, the uh, private individuals, everybody had a right to uh, comment on the farmers' protests. And in, uh, in fact, uh, I would say that the government of India has been extremely unreasonable by the, uh, being very intolerant. In fact, uh, many people who wrote about it, spoke about it, they uh, um, charged them with... Uh, Sedition, a law which was uh, uh, has been in operation for 150 years from the British time. Uh, so uh, you know the government's intolerance uh, to uh, such comments is absolutely uh, not acceptable. Also, you know when the British Parliament discussed it, suddenly we started talking about you know another Parliament discussing it is not fair, and uh, now our uh, Prime Minister can come to the USA and say that the next government should be uh, of Trump if he, he can make uh, such a uh, direct blatant interference in the political affairs of America. Uh, how can we the, then be critical 
when america comments on our internal affairs so there's this so there's this duplicity that you've remarked upon several times and 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 i appreciate that i, I want to kind of get everyone in on that but but before we do um there's a, there's a question here from uh, Sarah Ashworth how do we effectively combat hateful speech without government censorship or intervention lu first uh, and then you know and then i'll come to you um david all right uh, well look and there are legal precedents and the lawyers in the room can speak to them about the supreme court def- actually defending hate speech as being protected i don't like it very much but it comes back again to a very ancient philosophical point and it comes really from indian philosophy and from buddhism and also from confucian traditions and namely that the hater is always wrong to hate so hatred is a state of a poisoned mind if someone utters hate speech against whomever that person is to be pitied because their minds are poisoned with hate shutting them down will not cure or alleviate the poison in their minds education will help them and what kind of education of course is a longer story about a person should not be treated as a criminal for uttering hateful opinions the person be tr- should be treated as someone who needs help for harboring a hateful state of mind i think that's the biggest takeaway from this entire sort of panel if we have it uh pity the hater and uh, you know let's come to you yeah i mean uh, hate uh, must be uh, must be avoided and i think that education is the is the way to 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 in fact surpass this um, this problem i think i think that uh, if if people uh, are educated in 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 the way that they can adopt uh, i mean human values uh, i think this uh, this can be avoided of course i mean the state uh, must uh, must act in a sense that um, uh, that prohibits this um, this uh, this kind of uh, this kind of things uh in a, and from my point of view in a in a way that uh, that promotes uh in fact education that's uh, that's uh, that's the it, solution i think of course this is very utopian but uh well, that, that's the only way is it because um please forgive me but uh, as i understand it there are nations in europe that are already teaching um news literacy and fake news detection in classrooms this is happening in europe as we speak so to say that it is not implementable or not possible uh, is perhaps um just not true so so that so that's an interesting point yeah, that's true. Uh, greg do you want to come in before david very uh, oh oh sorry i didn't want to interrupt david um but just just really quickly um the, i th- i think we got to think a little bit more like scholars though a lot of times i think that ultimately the state that w- that, that would be so beneficial to society would be that uh, to be able to cultivate that a little bit sometimes of, of of detachment and ask yourself what is this about what why is this person hateful where are they coming from and jonathan rausch who's one of the true champions of the philosophy of freedom of speech um is a, is a gay rights activist he's he, I, I, actually his husband is is basically my 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 uh, my son's godfather um and he talks about things you actually had to know what what the haters were thinking and one thing that he he points out a lot is they had misconceptions they thought that that gays were more likely to molest children but you could actually look that up and it's just simply not true um and that you can look into these these kind of stereotypes and figure out what it's coming from to address it but if we just kind of treat it like some kind of magical thing that we have to push away guess what they're going to talk to each other exclusively and that leads to group polarization and it makes things worse in life group polarization uh, feedback loops this idea of kind of like finding your own hate group on twitter all of these things are big problems david i want to come to you with a very specific question the supreme court not the american one the one facebook has just set up who are going to be seeing their first happening in america where you have corporations that are exempt from uh, uh, uh freedom of speech laws are having to draft their own because their governments simply cannot keep up <laughs> well i i mean you know i'll go back to kind of what i said at the beginning i i'm a basically a free market guy and you know these these companies are private companies and i know they become so ubiquitous in our lives that they feel like uh an indispensable part of our lives and that they somehow have to play by rules that government set up but uh on on a topic like this you know if you don't like the rules that 
a private club creates, and essentially Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are private clubs, then you create your own. I mean, if Facebook is is the modern version of a of a civic civic society that might have existed 200 years ago. And if you didn't like that group, you and what they stood for or what they allowed you to say or not say, you went down the street and you joined another club. And that's kind of the way I feel about Facebook and Twitter. I, I think they have the right to do whatever it is they're doing in this regards. Yes, but not if they masquerade as technology platforms and are protected by 230. All right. And then and they took down Parlor. Okay, they took down Parlor because Parlor did exactly what you said you should do, form your own club and tolerate your own kind of speech. So why did they take it down? And by what right did they take it down? Lou, can I ask you to please explain the difference between a publisher and a platform so that those who are watching now can uh, sort of follow this discussion? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professor, not a lawyer. So the professorial interpretation, and I will stand corrected if in error, is that if you're a private company, it's exactly as David says. You could ban someone from wearing a T-shirt, you know, that says "Make America Great Again" or "Make America Crummy" for the, for, you know, or whatever you want. You could ban that because that speech is not protected on private premises. But if you're masquerading as a public platform that only does a technological service, and that anybody can join Facebook to begin with. Yes. And if you're going to have arbitrary so-called community standards so that you take down later what you don't like because it violates community standards, which are arbitrary, then you really are in a very gray area and you should be actually liable for damages that you do just as a publisher is, although they're private, too. But they're liable for they're liable for damages. These these places aren't. We will see what happens when the first cases uh, that the Facebook Supreme Court come um, head to head with the United States Supreme Court and Supreme Courts all over the world, indeed, um, in Europe uh, and in India. OK, we have but five minutes. Uh, and in the next five minutes, I would like to go around with a minute each, if I might, from each one of my uh, contributors and my panelists, just for their personal reasons of what, what they feel when I ask the question, what are the limits of freedom of expression? Nuno, let me come to you. Yeah, freedom of expression is absolutely essential in a democratic society and you must fight for it. But there are limits or, and there must be uh, uh, clear rules uh, so that we can know uh, what we can in fact express and uh, uh, so that we can also know the lines we cannot cross. That's my thank point you. of view. Nuno, thank you so much. S.Y., let me come to you. What are the limits of freedom of speech in one minute, please? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, the uh, reasonable restriction, the a term used by our constitution, I think is a very important expression because it's a question of right versus right. You have a right to the free speech. I have a right to live peacefully. So therefore, um, uh, reasonable restrictions become very, very important in, in that context. And uh, I th uh, think that uh, even in the US, the US and India have quite a common ground. And uh, all the, almost all the speakers did talk about situations where free speech has to be restricted. Thank you so much. Let's move on. David. Sorry. Yes. Um, you know, I think I think it's important. You get, we all get caught, so caught up in the legalities of freedom of speech. We often forget our obligations as human beings, you know, and that, as I said earlier, if I had, if I could leave this this audience with one sentiment is. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should, you know, and and rem remember the obligation we have to each other to try and find objective truth and actually be making the effort. And everybody's made a good argument for why sometimes that's difficult, but we have to at least try and not not um, go out of our way to avoid it. And And that, in a sense, is the limit on freedom of expression that I think is imposed upon us as human beings, not by any court, not by any regulation, not by any constitution, but it is the thing that we have to strive for. Decorum, decorum, gentlemen, decorum. <laughs> Moving on, Greg. Um, you know, I, I'm going to I'm going to be patriotic in a way that only a first generation American or an immigrant can be. Um, and I obnoxiously go to other countries and, and say this, but I really do mean it. I've studied the American First Amendment um, for my entire career, and I think it is the best, most the soundest, uh, most thought out way to have free speech in the real world. 
If you want a diverse pluralistic society, there are things that actually comport so well also, also with recent uh, psychological findings um, that I really want to be a, an evangelist for this. So believe me, like it's deeper than you think. It's better thought out than you think. Um, and I'd be happy to, you know, talk about this all day. Um, so hopefully people will follow up. Uh, yes. Uh, if you guys could put all of your handles, followships and whatever into the comment section, I'm sure people can do that should they need to. Lou, you have the final minute, please. Well, thank you for the last word. I'll try to live up to it. I, I do agree with a lot of what our, my co-panelists have said. I wish we could continue the discussion and hear more from them as well. But let me close with this. What we've not had time to state is uh, that there is open hatred being preached on American campuses from coast to coast, and, and, and Greg is well aware of it. Open hatred of whites, open hatred of patriarchy, open hatred of Christianity, open hatred of Israel, and, and, there, and voices that would defend uh, some of these things are being silenced. So let me say this. The Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci warned that one could bring down a civilization without firing a shot if one could commandeer its cultural institutions. And this is exactly what is happening across Western civilization. And God help us all if it continues. And with that, uh, I would like to end this particular session. Thank you for those of you who are watching. Thank you to everyone who commented. Thank you to my panelists who were impassioned, uh, albeit a little embattled, as we dug through this very important discussion on what are the limits of freedom of expression. I have been Nella Hedayat. Thank you for tuning in. That's all from us. Say goodbye, everybody. Great job to you. Thank Have you. Fun. Great work.